misinterpreted last one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't jump the gun this time. Welcome back, everybody, for the actual recording. Um, I'm just talking tonight above the table. Um, I'm actually not going to be leading the majority of this because A, I've got a headache, um, and B, be like it's a couple lazy. of... Well, a little bit lazy, but... So, we, so what um, you're saying is we should put this on you and Ned, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, totally. Yep. <laughs> please, please put it on me. You're the least experienced person here to lead the BTM's role talk. Yes. That's I what we're going to be doing. I believe I know as much as Kosio at this point. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. You've read the majority of the book. Yeah, you, um, you read the books. I look at them and I'm just like, oh my gosh, so many words. Yeah, it's fine. Um, anyway, I'm Dangle. Um, if you don't know this by now, you probably should, but it's fine if you don't. Hi. Uh, um, joining me tonight, I'll let them introduce themselves. Just see ya. Layla. Hey, I'm Buttons. And I'm Nanavar. So, um, I am going to actually hand it over to Buttons and Faye um, to kind of spearhead this entire thing. Just for the simple fact of, yeah. Um, Buttons has actually dealt with Vampire the Masquerade far longer than all of us. Faye has been doing a whole lot of reading lately. Um, and while I have a pretty good grasp on it, like I said, I've got a headache, and I'm feeling lethargic, so take it away. So tonight we're going to be, be going over the very basics of how to play Vampire the Masquerade. We will have other videos going into more depth, and at the end of it we will have a character creation video, and then potentially a how to build a chronicle. But first one, basic rules. So, to start, VTM is a game of monsters. You don't play the heroes. You can if you build the Chronicle like that, but most of the time, you play the monsters. They have this thing that they call the riddle. It's called, it goes, the beast I am, at least the beast I become. Sums up the game pretty well, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Unless that's... you're Kosia, who... <laughs> Cannot play evil at all. No, we'll touch on that here in a little bit. It's fine. The beast always finds a way at some point. So, I guess we should probably start at the beginning, huh? That's usually the best place to start. <laughs> okay, so, um... To start off with explaining some of the basic dice mechanics of Vampire the Masquerade, um, Vampire the Masquerade has a very kind of unique, kind of very unique system um, based on D10s, and they have varying levels of success or failure, and they some sometimes they even have their own dice if little focus of course yeah. those are not necessary you can in fact play with a, a normal d10 if you so desire uh, it's just a little bit easier if you just have three symbols to three or four symbols to contend with as opposed to uh, converting numbers to levels of success or failure that, that's very, very true. Having the actual dice made it so much easier than, like, trying to figure out and remember, like, one through five is the fail, and six through nine is the success, and a ten is the crit. Uh, I find the d10s are easy enough for me. I'm too cheap to buy the vampire dice. And that is definitely something to consider. Um, an important part of doing any tabletop role-playing game is uh, 
have fun and use what you have on hand if you can. Spend 200 bucks on an, on a deluxe set of aluminum dice like I did. Go for it. If not, just use like a random roller online or steal some D10s from your friend across the table. Use what you have on hand. I will say that um, there are multiple um, digital rollers if your storyteller allows them. Some don't, um, because I know some algorithms can kind of be messed with a little bit. Um, I know I used to not like them. At this point, they're all pretty, pretty good about the RNG random number generator. So if you are a storyteller that doesn't like them, I understand. However, maybe do your own like testing. Reconsider, maybe. Just putting that out there. So, with that said, let's thunk. Let's go over um, the basic components of the dice. And it's been a hot minute since I personally used the D10, so. Like a, like a standard D10 for this. Yep, I never understood that one, really. Um, but I've got... I've actually got the book uh, open on my lap. Um, yeah, shout out... Shout out to White Wolf Games for the beautiful books, by the way. Absolutely love them. Um, anyway, so... First thing you need to know is that there are actually two different sets of dice. There are your standard dice, which are solid black, and then you have your hunger dice, which we'll go over the function of of hunger dice a little bit later on, but they're they're the red dice. And And if you do use regular D tens real fast, you want to make sure that you have two different colors. Yes. Yes. So, basics here, and I'm going to show them on the... Yeah, I'm going to show them on the red dice because they show up a little bit better, I think, but... Um... Here, just talk and I'll hold up the dice. Okay, cool. Uh, skulls are failures. Or bestial failures if there's some sort of a test. Uh, on a D10, these correspond to the number one. A blank side is a regular failure, and these correspond to the numbers 2 through 5. An onk, just a regular onk, is a success, and these correspond to the numbers 6 through 9. And then finally, you have the onk with fangs. And this, or with stars, depending on which side of which set of dice you're currently using, um, this is a critical success or a messy critical if it's part of a critical win. Um, these correspond to the number ten on a regular dice. And so that's kind of the that's kind of the basics of. What the die, what the dice symbolize, how you can do that. Um, shoot, let's see. Let's see. Next, after that, we're going through re-rolling dice. Uh, the next one was roll difficulties. Yes, difficulties. Um. And feel free to feel free to jump in, guys, at any at any point. Yep. Because this is the uh, setting challenge difficulty is something I don't have a lot of personal experience with yet because I haven't been storyteller for a game. But so, go ahead. So as far as setting the difficulties, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, if it's going to be something that's pretty trivial, like. Carving a stake. It's really 
one like one success is all you really should need. Um, like something vaguely heavy, one. Yeah, vaguely heavy point blank shot on an unknowing target, that'd be one success is all you need. Um something that would be deemed as basically impossible to fail. Barring any like outside circumstances. Um anything normally not necessarily difficult, but not like trivial should be too. Um so this would include stuff like if you're driving, taking quarter corner at speed without really slowing down a whole lot. Um for somebody that's a decent marksman making a shot from a bit further away. Um at like a target range. Um, possibly like if you know how to like hack or something, um, hacking a very simple password or whatever, or bypassing a firewall, stuff like that, depending or, on exactly what's going on in the background. Or socially, if the person your players are talking to likes them and trying to convince them of something, it'd be a one or a two. Yeah. Two um, if, it if it goes a little bit out of their way. It, it, yeah, or it makes the NPC go a little bit out of their way. Or if it could possibly be dangerous to them. Um three would be something hard, like getting somebody that doesn't really like you to help you. Perfect example of where you I would personally put three successes is what you would need. Um keeping Control of a car in the rain at high speed. Perfect example of a three. Um, need a little bit of skill to do that. Don't necessarily need to be like a master driver, but um, taking an exceptionally long shot with a small firearm, um, throwing a knife 30 yards. Steven. Throwing, um, throwing another kindred across the room. Yep, yeah, throwing another kindred across the room. Um, which I believe that you got like seven on that, but it's fine. I did. Um, just stuff like that. Um, should be more difficult. And then as it gets more difficult, keep going up. Um, I would try to cap it at like five successes, is what you really need. And that would be something that's pretty near impossible for a normal human being. Kindred, they're a little bit different. They can do special things putting that out there. Um, but yeah, that's how I would personally set them and like examples. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I can't really see setting above a six unless you're actually setting them up for failure, which you shouldn't do. Yes, or in the very off chance that like there's no way that this would actually work, but you want to give them a chance. Right. And you want to just kind of go with it. Like, jump from building to the building, jumping through a small bathroom window that's, like, two foot tall by, like, three foot wide, and they have to plan perfectly. I would put that as a six. I'd give you a chance, but the chances of you actually making it is slim to none. Let's put it out. Let's be honest here. I think that's a good segue into how to get your dice pools with skills and attributes. We will go over them in depth more so later. Um, Buttons is having sound issues. She will be right back. Um, but your skills... Oh, wait. Um, I do not have my handy book in front of me currently. Um, it's fine. So... Physical, they're broken up into three types of skills. Physical, social, and mental. Physical being strength, dex, and stamina. Social is charisma, manipulation, and composure. Mental is intelligence, wits, and resolve. Yes, and from there you have skills that would typically be assigned to those three categories. Um, like athletics being... Physical. Um, uh, persuasion. Yep. 
um, persuasion being social, and then we like a cult here um, being mental. Three. Each... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say each um, attribute has nine skills associated with it, and several of those um, are things like craft, which you can make your own. And then you get specialties, which we'll go over again later, but just know that that's a thing, too. With that said, um, and we'll cover this a little bit more in depth later on, um, just putting it out there now. When assigning attributes, I would recommend looking at uh, clan disciplines, because a lot of clan disciplines require certain attributes and skills to work so those are so those are going to be things that you're going to be using a lot and you may want to pay those more attention than skills you might not be using for your powers yeah don't don't just wing it like i did with beth i just threw numbers in willy-nilly i mean it's working out okay so far but you know plan ahead so in order to build your dice pool um, say the storyteller calls for a persuasion roll for charisma and persuasion. Because you will always have an attribute and a skill, or an attribute and a discipline. Very rarely a skill and a discipline, and sometimes two attributes, depending on how the storyteller calls it. But you would take the number of dots you allocate into each one of those and add them up. And that is the amount of dice you roll. Perfect example here. Um, Tori goes to do surgery on somebody. Four points in, in intelligence and three in medicine? Three or four? Either way. Four. Okay. I know it's a whole bunch. So, eight dice there. Um, Beth goes to make a drive check. Usually it's going to be Dexton drive. Again, both of those are very high. Two for Dex, three or four for Drive. I can't remember off the top of my head, so. Yeah. There's nothing to sneeze at. Um, in the same aspect, Beth goes to make an academics check. Or an academics test. It's going to be intelligence and academics. You have one dice to yep, roll there. One. I have one intelligence and nothing in academics. Yep. So. I only know this because we recently had that, and I, it's kind of stuck in my mind. <laughs> so you can have really good dice pools, and you can have really bad dice pools. And the fun thing about VCM is that even with eight dice, Tori can still absolutely fail that medicine check and just completely botch it. Um, there is kind of like in other systems where you can take half, I believe. It's one of their alternate variant rolls. Um... I don't remember it off the top of my head exactly. I know it's there, though. Yeah, Which it's there. It's just that's... averaging your dice pool, and that's what you would quote-unquote roll. Yeah. Um, and typically, that would be something that you're um, very well-versed at, and you do all the time. Major surgery probably wouldn't allow that, personally. Right, but um, a cut is potentially stitches. a broken arm, sure. Yeah. Broken arm, stitches, um, dressing a wound. Sure, go ahead. And sometimes the storyteller might even just gloss over the fact that they're using that for you if it's something they know your character does. So they might not even call for a role. And the other thing to note about using a dice pool is um, this is kind of where hunger really comes into play. Because unless otherwise specified by the storyteller, you're typically going to swap a certain number of your uh, regular black dice for your red hunger dice corresponding to how hungry you are. For example, if uh, Shiloh wants to make an intimidation check... Uh, with uh, charisma and intimidation, and she's at three hunger, 
uh, three of those dice, because that's a pool of seven, three of those dice are now red dice. And that can hurt you because when you, uh, the next, uh, sorry, the next mechanic we're going to be talking about is willpower. Willpower lets you re-roll a certain number of dice, but it doesn't let you re-roll blood dice. So it limits your potential for success. Yep. And typically you're going to spend one willpower for three black dice. Don't forget the other things for the hunger dice, too. The bestial yep. failures. Which are when the beast takes over. Yeah, and or at we least haven't seen rears that its at head. all. No, not at all. Yeah, but um, we don't have an episode called uh, Messy Night. No. <laughs> Best Bestial Failures and Messy Criticals are something to be aware of. They shouldn't happen super often unless you roll a spectacular nine in one episode or something like that, but you know. Yep. And I'm a little bit more lenient on that. Um, if it makes sense for the roll, I will allow it, but if it's like Tori has a messy critical on an occult roll, as a gang girl, that doesn't make any damn sense. I'm sorry. It just doesn't to me. Um, Steven, on the other hand, yes. Steven does a cult roll, has a delusion, starts seeing the occult that he was trying to think of. I can see that. Yeah, that, that would be fun. Yep. Shiloh does the same thing, I believe. The salubri one, you just are super empath. You get you yeah, get, you get hyper empathetic and have to work towards solving a problem. Yep. So I would basically just randomly pick somebody and you feel what they feel. Congratulations. Um, typically, it's going to be the empathy toward whatever the target is. If there's no specific target, then randomize. That's how I would do it. That's just me. And again, like I said, I'm super, super lenient on the role. If it doesn't make any sense, I'm not going to enforce that. Just because, you know, it's me. And I don't want to have to deal with some of it. The next is willpower. Well, we kind of already started going over it before we jumped back. But willpower is definitely a very powerful and potent mechanic in the game. Uh, there is, just like in health, there is aggravated and superficial. Superficial is, I believe, what you spend to use for rerolls. You can reroll three black dice. Yep, and you can spend multiple willpower per roll if you need to. And want to. Only up to the number of black dice. Yes. Um, if you have five, you can spend two willpower to re-roll all five, of course. But once you run out of superficial willpower, you started taking aggravated, which is much harder to heal. Which we will get over healing and all of that in a later video. But I believe it is, what, Resolve and Composure? Yes, those two pools together makes up your willpower pool. So, if you make a, like, brand new Baby Kindred, like, yesterday they were embraced, and you put all of your, you put four into Resolve and three into Composure, you have seven, that's the max you can have. Later date, you can buy more, but we'll cover that later. I think we jumped ahead on our list. I swapped willpower and consequences of failure. My apologies. Um, 
Adding back on to that consequences of failure, though, which would be the the um, messy, critical, bestial failures and things like that. There is frenzies, compulsions, and hunger. Which we briefly touched on compulsions. A little bit. Um, so every night your kindred awakes, awakens, you have to roll what is called a rouse check, which basically means how hungry you are that night or how much hunger you are stockpiling if you don't feed. Looking at Beth. But what? there's also no, rouse we always feed. There's also rouse checks for when you use your abilities, which again, we'll get into later, but your disciplines and stuff will cost typically a rouse check. And whether you succeed or fail on those, it still happens. And as mentioned earlier, hunger is a very, very important mechanic to keep an eye on. Should we go into depth in that now? Yeah, we probably should. Well, I think we so, have the blood in the next one, which we could do hunger there too if we wanted to. Uh, that is that is true. Um, we'll just we'll we'll just kind of hit the hit the highlights of hunger here. So, typically, a kindred will be will start out around one or two hunger. Yeah. Um, beginning were... of the chronicle. Um, ahead, you should. Beginning of Chronicle, you should start out at one. Um, the storyteller might call for a rouse check on the initial night. Um, they might not. Depends on how nice they're being. Um, I tend to be a little bit nicer to mine. So, minimum base hunger does depend on generation somewhat, which we'll get into generations later. It's a kind of a complicated thing. Typically, you're going to be playing lower generate or higher generations, my apologies. Um, 13th, 11th, 12th will typically be the ones you start playing in. Um, it, that just means you don't have to worry too much about where your hunger comes from. It, or how you take care of that. You will always have one hunger unless you... Over... No, I don't want to say overfeed, but take more than a mortal can get. Like Spanky Boy. Like Spanx. <laughs> this is weird, because if you're at one hunger, that's like five liters of blood you have to drink in order to get rid of it. I don't... So, hunger in V5 is not measured like it was in V20, which seems more like what you could pull from realistically. Um... The best way I can to kind of describe it in V5 is the amount of effort into the blood, at least for the beast. Because um, five points obviously isn't the amount of blood in your system. And if it was like that, you would be getting one hunger every night regardless. Because you're, the blood's burning through. So I, I think it's best described as the effort that is amounted to the blood. That's a good analogy. And with that said, the more effort you put into feeding, the more blood, the more hunger you can get rid of. But you have to be careful. Because if you get rid of all your hunger, you have to extinguish your target. And there is a system in the book um, describing how much you can pull from each thing. Typically dogs and other medium-sized creatures like that, you can pull one, maybe two dots from without extinguishing their life. Smaller ones like rats and cats and things like that, you only get one. Um, humans, I think you can get a couple, maybe three. Not 100% sure on that two. one. Two is the max that I was looking at up earlier. Okay. Yep. If you, if you like take as much as they can maximally give without killing them, get two if you're just taking like a sip okay yeah and if you take three then 
technically speaking, the target has to make a roll, and it, it gets complicated. That being said, if you say, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and just take it all, you still take all of it, so it is what it is. And with that said, on the other end, if you let your hunger ramp up, three, it starts to get a little dicey. Four, you're really risking it. Any hunger past four, something kind of special happens. Yes, we have seen it once Sorry. in our games. It was a fun night. Um, the beast kind of overwhelms your conscious mind. I won't say human because you're not human anymore. It overwhelms the conscious mind and you become very animalistic and all you want to do in that moment is feed. There are a few different types of frenzies. That one is a hunger frenzy. All the beast cares about is getting food. Yep. Um, and that can come from multiple sources. Um, even if you are a bagger and you don't have that available, it will be like, eat that person. I don't care. Um, if you are a blood leech and all you have is mortals, you'll be like, eat that mortal. I don't care. Um, so at that point in time, the beast doesn't care. It just says, eat, feed me, get me out of here. Which I feel is a good segue into humanity and stains. Because certain feeding types, again, we'll get into more depth later, have prey exclusions, which if you eat what you have as a prey exclusion, you have a very high potential to have a stain on your humanity. Humanity is exactly what it sounds like. It is the human mind versus the bestial mind. How much control you have over the beast, not what the beast has over you. How much your emotions are humane. Um, and how much you care, <laughs> for lack of a better word. How much logic you have when dealing with not necessarily um, kindred but actual humans. I don't know if logic is the correct restraint. word. Because low humanity yeah. can still be logical. It is how humane yeah. you are when dealing with them. Yeah. How much restraint you also have. Yes. Yeah. Which is kind of the core theme of the whole the whole kitten caboodle. How close do you stay to your, your humanity versus how much do you let yourself go? They say it several times in the book. The downward spiral of humanity. It is so easy to stain it, so easy to lose it, and so difficult to get it back. Yep. Um, Usually. Yes. Some sources would say that it's impossible, but it's not necessarily impossible. It's just exceedingly hard, especially once you get to seven or eight humanity. Um, getting anything higher than that is next to impossible. Seven is where most vampires in the well, even 14th, 15th, and 16th, but 16th through 11th generations will typically start at 7th humanity, which a normal human sits at about 8, I believe, as well. So you're one step below that. Right, and that's just simply due to your nature of you have to feed how you have to feed. There are some feeding types that lose it, certain ones that add to it. Correct. Um, but to go with the whole humanity and stains and such, gaining the stains, like Faye said, is pretty easy. Um, if you're not careful, you can get a stain, you can damage your humanity permanently. Um, if you kill somebody, you're technically supposed to have a stain if it wasn't absolutely necessary. 
um, certain feeding habits that we've seen you're technically supposed to lose humanity doing. Um, if you go against, which we'll cover this later, um, your convictions it's supposed to stain your humanity. Um, if you go against certain touchstones, if you lose a touchstone, if something happens regarding any of that, you're supposed to have a stain. That being and, said, yeah. oh, go ahead. we haven't covered that a whole lot yet. I'm sure it will be coming up at some point. In order to get your humanity back or unstain, I believe what you do is roll your unstained humanity. And if you exceed the stained, it goes away if you have properly felt bad for it over the length of the story. The game. That singular game. Yeah, that sounds about right. If you fail, all of the stains go away and you lose one humanity. You also can lose a humanity if your stains go over the amount of unstained or out of your total humanity. This is true. And what happens if you lose too much humanity? Ooh, then you enter, what is it, Wassail? And then the beast takes over and you lose your character. You become a, a white. Yes, the Wassail yeah. is the initial burst of the beast coming through. The white is what happens after. Yes, and a white, for lack of better term, is just a... Um, walking just being of destruction it wants to eat everything that's bad it wants to destroy everything that it touches um, it well it can be intelligent it typically does the most straightforward path to get what it wants rather than necessarily um planning and tactics. Not to say that it can't, but it typically doesn't. It is all the repressed bestial emotions and everything that has come from being turned into a kindred, all balled up into one big ball of hate. Uh, from what I was reading, you um, said that uh, willpower can determine how intelligent it behaves based on when you lose all that humanity. Yes, that has part to do with it, and I'm sure there's more to it, but yeah. Definitely read the book for nuances. We are just going over basic rules over here. Mm -hmm. Speaking of hunger and wassail, <laughs> now, we're, now we're moving on to styles of hunting. Just a brief overview. Again. So, hunting in its most basic definition is how a vampire sates their hunger. Did you have something you wanted to input there, Faye? Nope, I okay. thought we were jumping to combat. Sorry? I thought we were going to combat, my bad. Oh, uh, no, I have hunting on my list. It's fine. Yeah. Hunting. So, um, as mentioned earlier, there are different styles of hunting that come with certain costs and certain benefits. Uh, particularly in this coterie, we have, um, let's see, Shiloh and Stephen are baggers, which means that we take our blood well as it says bagged we don't we typically don't feed from um live sources 
jumping in real fast with that one, the only way one a kindred can drink bagged blood is with the iron gullet mallet merit, which we'll get into that more in depth later. But that is the only way one can eat bagged blood and have it do anything for them, which that feeding type gives. Mm-hmm. Um, and sorry, go ahead. Nope. <laughs> and with that, um, we can get certain other, other little bits and bobs here and there that kind of help support being able to uh, feed in that manner, like in my personal example, um, Shiloh ended up with, uh, with, let's see, it was, uh, it was proficiency in, uh, black market. She got a Dotton Street Wise and a, spe a special, speciality, I'm sorry, in black market dealings, which can be used to access bagged blood. Um, Kosia, what, uh, what, feed what feeding type does Beth use? Beth is, or thought at least, that she was a consensualist, which means that she had to get permission to feed, which actually breaks the masquerade. And, um, and uh, the speciality that she took was persuasion, and it it's particular uh, specifically uh, on the vessels, people that you feed from, you have advantage on, or not advantage, but extra dice. Yes. What's uh, Stephen is a bagger, but what did he pick for his stuff? Um, like, uh, disciplines or the specialty? No. How Shiloh has black market. You should have gotten a special thing from your feeding type. Oh, I got a larceny, uh, ah. which was uh, a specialized in lock picking. Which, and Fori? Oh, go ahead. My bad. Which seems fitting for Steven. If, in my opinion. Yes. It's also come in handy for us. Um, Tori we're, is... We're torture in, um, in this human life, so on occasion where the pay was low, he had to get his food somehow. So Tori is a blood leech. It's a very... not looked highly upon one. It can cause a lot of problems when it comes out. One of the flaws... It gives a couple flaws which is why it's one of the more difficult ones to work around, technically. Uh, it gives a dark secret, either Diablerist or... Uh, I forget what the other one is. Um, I picked dark secret Diablerist, meaning that she has devoured other kindred to their final death, which we'll touch on later. Um, uh, the other one is that I also picked up Prey Exclusion Mortals, and then my advantage was stealth against kindred. Yes. Which hasn't necessarily come up except twice. for one. Yeah, yeah twice. Um, but it's supposed to help you hunt. That being said, she doesn't necessarily want to hunt in her current um, abode and we area. Will get into how Tori hunts, I think, in the next... after the episode 10 games. Yes. Um, and along with our three, um, you also have stuff like Alley Cat, which basically they just ambush people and kind of just do what they want. Um, there's an extortionist. We're going to have a better breakdown in them in the next episode. Okay. But it's yeah, there's really soon. Yeah, there's just a bunch more. Um, there are. And each one, like was previously stated, has specialties uh, that go along with them. Um, 
as well as disciplines that would also go along with them that we'll cover at a later date. Can I just say it's funny that Worry hates it whenever Kindred or anyone really sneaks up on her, but she has stealth advantage on Kindred. Why do you think she hates it? <laughs> um yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so we've uh, talked a little bit about dice and how they kind of affect a lot of the role-playing aspects and all of that fun stuff. Now it's time to move on to fighting mechanics. These tend to be pretty straightforward. Um... If you're going to use fang, fist, claw, foot, head, body part, typically it's going to be a um, brawl, either strength or dexterity. Typically going to be strength. Um, if you can justify dexterity to me, I will let you do it, but you don't really have to justify it for me. Um, if you are using a handheld weapon, like a knife, for instance, or a crowbar, or a metal rod, or anything of that nature, um, that will be a melee. Again, if it's a heavier, I would probably say that you want to go with strength. If it's a lighter one, a quicker one, like a butcher knife, um, that would be dex. Um, obviously firearm would be firearm almost always going to be dex unless if there's some special like property to do to it and then you have to like tell me exactly why that's just it's me. a bazooka it needs strength yeah I don't know what I would necessarily say with that one um, I don't know it was just the first thing that popped in my head and I'm not helping I will be quiet now no you're good you're good um now, special cases. If you throw something at somebody. Storyteller might say that it's brawl. Someone might say it's melee. If they say that it's firearms, they're probably wrong. Just saying. Unless if it's like a slingshot. I guess a slingshot could technically be under firearms. I don't know I'd want to use a slingshot, though. Because, yeah. Um... I know there's more to it. I know I know there's more to it. Um, but along with those combat roles, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be physical combat. Technically, there's social combat as well. Rules in that get really, really muddy really, really fast for me. Um, I'm not good at them. I'm not going to lie. I'm still trying to figure them, figure them out 100%. So, I'm going to ha hand that off to somebody that has the book for that. <laughs> I do not have it in front of me currently. But it's the same kind of way. If you're trying to persuade someone into something, it's going to probably be charisma and persuasion. Although, if you're trying to be, I don't know, witty about it, you could potentially have a, call, a role for wits and persuasion. If you're trying to outsmart the other person or something like that. Um, so you could also have like manipulation and subterfuge, manipulation, intimidation. Um, yep. Typically not going to do manipulation, persuasion, but you could, theoretically. Yeah, it'd be one of the rarer roll calls and probably be more like you would have to justify that one. Yeah, for me. Um, persuasion just kind of screams more charisma to me. But charisma and leadership could also be part of that. Um, to try to turn, say, like a crowd rather than a singular person. And 
And all of these roles we're talking about will and can be backed up by disciplines. Um, oftentimes it will either add a dice or um, add a static number, rarely. Um, feral weapons as adds a static number to your brawl. Um, and there's also ones that like help boost your mental powers and all that stuff. Disciplines will come in a later time where we will kind of deep dive into them. Just be aware that they will change how the roles work. So, with that said, let's backtrack just a little bit to active combat scenes. Just kind of, just kind of break it down a little bit before we move on. Um, turns are determined by dexterity. Yes. There's a couple um, different ways to do it. Yeah. I know some storytellers say ranged weapons go first, and then melee weapons, or melee combat. Some people do it that way, some people determine it by dexterity. Some, like me at times, just kind of random order go around in a circle. That typically works better for me in this particular setting. Most of our stuff is fairly... Similar. There was one time you had us pick two different attributes, I think, and we all ended up with like the exact same. So, yeah. And sometimes and it, I was like, we determine it, or you determine it by who's acting first to initiate combat, and that's who rolls first. Yes. Um, I tried the whole like pick these two and then do something, and then yeah, I realized oh that's like. They're all the same, except for Steven that has a ridiculously high dex. So, yeah. Um, that's about the time that I was like, I'm just going to arbitrarily pick as needed. So We also don't do large-scale like fights. It's usually like very small, very like maybe in like an intersection is the biggest that we'll get. So there's not a whole lot of ground to cover. Yeah, it should be noted that in general, VTM V5 is not particularly set up for mass, like, big battles or anything like that. It's unless there's something that I haven't tapped into. No, I was going to also add in long battles. It's typically yes. very quick, very brutal. Three, maybe four, maybe five rounds and out is typically what you're going to look at, look into there. Um, could be one round, could be two. That being said, that specifically the part that covers this in the book is three rounds and out is what it says. And it's literally one round, two round, three rounds, you're out of combat. The is the active kindred thing in the book, or was that your call? By the way, um, I have. I don't know if it's specifically in the book, but I've seen multiple storytellers on multiple things that I've watched use that, and I have looked for it in the book, and I either I haven't seen it, or it's there, and it's there, or I haven't seen it because it's not there. One of the two. Okay, um, then I don't know if you should include it or not. It is potentially a homebrew, but helps break tiebreakers. Active Kindred has not advantage, but if you meet, they ma if you meet, they overcome. Whoever is actively doing the uh, combat in whichever way. Yeah, like Steven swings a bat at Tori. They both get the same amount. Steven hits Tori. Tori then yanks it out of his hand. They match again. Tori yanks it out of his hand. That type of thing. For, for damage like that would most likely be minimal damage, if any, at that point. But they would still meet and exceed. Yes. Yes. 
Which is a perfect segue into our next segment, Breaking Down Damage. Which we talked a little bit about earlier when we were going over willpower. Uh, superficial versus... Uh, doc. Aggravated. Aggravated. Aggravated, yes, thank you. Superficial damage you can incur... And it doesn't take as much to he heal as Aggravated does. And, oh god, I had the breakdown. There's a certain, there's a certain threshold of... Uh, superficial damage you can take before it becomes aggravated and then when you take too much aggravated damage uh, you don't necessarily die immediately but it gets bad so typically you have your health pools um, it is determined by your stamina and composure I'm fairly certain it is actually your stamina plus two Unless okay. if you have disciplines that will raise right. that. <clears throat> um, which there are ones that raise that. So, whatever your health pool is, you can take that much superficial damage. The minute you take an additional one, it your first, it immediately turns into aggravated damage. You can meet your health pool in aggravated damage, and then you fall into torpor. The next point of damage gets iffy. Um, if it is l attempting to be lethal, that is when it is lethal. Yep. Um, to kind of go along with that, uh, certain things bypass superficial damage, which I don't know if we want to cover that right now or not. But we can. We were hitting fire at the end. There are a plethora of weapons, um, noticeably from the Second Inquisition and created by other kindred that do bonuses, additional damage, um, overgo, or I keep blanking on the word. Going straight to aggravated damage. Uh, there's a lot of different things like that, but those are all more um, specialty things. But I believe yeah, there are disciplines that will do that as well. This is correct. Um, staking, if you meet a strength of five plus, you can take them straight to torpor without doing any damage. Yes, but the second that you take it back out, they come back. They basically, yeah. Torpor they has its own set of rules that we will dive into later, but if you fall into torpor, um, if it's by damage, then you attempt to heal the damage while you're in torpor, but that gets really bad with hunger. And you're not being fed. Um, because unless someone is feeding you, then you're just... The beast is just becoming more and more mad and enraged. If it's from staking, then as he said, you'll just pop back up. <laughs> with a big hole in your chest. Yep, and you'll be... You're still going to be mad, but you're going to probably have your wits about you. Yeah, it would go in as aggravated damage, but probably only by one or two aggravated damage if the if it's strictly a staking and it comes out. And then the final death is the final death. Yes. Exactly what uh, it sounds like. It is your kindred will not come back. Yep. Um, depending on if, well, Certain flaws make it easier for you to do that. Um, certain ways to go about doing that, you can physically take the head off. That will cost final death. 
staking uh, typically does not cause the final death. Unless your storyteller gives multiple NPCs with staking. It was just that one. It was just that one. Yeah, Beth doesn't have that flaw. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Um, like I said, fire can cause that quickly. Uh, sunlight can cause that. True faith weapons can cause that. Being said, we'll cover those later. Now, if we want to touch on healing, I think now would be a very good time for it. Indeed. Yes. So, to heal aggravated damage, you can make a rouse check at the end, or once each night. Um, I believe it's just a singular rouse check roll, correct? Yes. And you roll... And you gain, heal one point of aggravated damage, regardless of, well, you have to succeed it, um, and that also gets you a hunger if you fail it, but you heal it regardless, I believe. This is correct. Um, for superficial damage, for your health, it... Depends on your generation and also your blood potency. Typically, you're going to have a blood potency of one, which you will heal one point of superficial damage per rouse check, I believe. If you're like my character, you have a blood potency of two, and a rouse check for healing will heal two points of superficial damage. Um, if you have a blood potency of zero, you will still heal one because it is minimal. Unless I believe you have a law stating otherwise. Yeah, which thin bloods are a whole different beast, whole different animal. Um, pardon the pun, of course. Uh, but thin bloods are special. And they will typically, not always, but typically have a blood potency of zero. You can buy blood potency. But that's, again, we'll cover that later. Uh, you can only buy blood potency up to what your generation allows. Yes, this is also true. Uh, but that's for something else. Um, anyway, for healing, that is how you heal your health. Now, the willpower, I'm not 100% sure on. Yeah. I know that's a lot easier. Um, you don't need Roush checks. You don't need all this other fun stuff. Um, I don't have it up right in front of me. I know it's supposed to be a certain number per night, and I don't remember the exact number. Um, let's see here. At the beginning of a session, vampires and mortals alike can remove a number of superficial willpower damage leveled up to their composure or resolve rating using the highest. There you go. Um... We have never really used that much in a session, barring the single time that Tori used pretty much all of hers. Um, That's actually where I'm sitting at right now. Three or four. Yeah. Um, so that's what it's supposed to be. Um, like I said, we don't use willpower a whole lot. Typically... Typically, they actually roll pretty good. So I don't... Like, we don't need to. That being said, um, if you just have a bad night and you use all of it, I'm sorry. You're going to be down some willpower for a little while. So what... Ha what happens... Come on. Discord. What happens when the willpower... All your aggravated... You hit all aggravated willpower. I don't remember what happens there. I believe you frenzy. It's just a frenzy? I believe so. Okay. Typically to avoid frenzies, you roll your willpower checks of unspent willpower. Yep. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that, though. So don't quote me. But I'm pretty sure that's what I read. Um, 
I gotta look at that again, which again, we haven't gotten that far. It hasn't been that dire yet. I say yet for good reasons. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say yet. I believe that covers everything. Um, touched on fire a little bit. Fire does immediately aggravated damage. Bypasses the superficial. Sunlight is even worse. Um, you can only spend typically a couple of rounds in sunlight before you're crispy. Yes. If that. If that. It really gets out sunburn. Yeah. And fire and sunlight automatically require a frenzy roll. Which, which that is, is your unspent is willpower. The Rorsch check. Yes. Um, I believe it's a German like spelling. Yes, it's very German spelling. I don't remember what the exact translation is, but it's basically a fire frenzy. Yep. Um, and I don't remember the exact number. I know the few times that we've had to, it's either been a massive success or complete failure. Um, and you cannot spell spend willpower on willpower rolls as well. You get what you get. That is the one exception to the whole, like, you can spell willpower to re-roll. I don't believe we have anything more to cover, Buttons. No, I think that got us through our list of basics. Um, again, this was just sort of a brief rundown in about an hour of hitting all the salient points. We'll be doing deeper dives into specific, into more specific details in the coming weeks. So, hope we see you back here for that. Thanks for sticking through us uh, stumbling through this. Uh, hopefully, it helped you a little bit. Us explaining yes. in terms that help us and we understand. Hey, it helped yeah. me, so it's already win. <laughs> <laughs> Kindred 101. Yeah. Kindred 101 as a player instead of, you know, as a Beth. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. Hey, dreams. Yep.